Okay, so we're starting the Recreation Committee. Pam, if you'll start, we're gonna do the unexpired term assignments through lottery for Mark and Calvin. If you wouldn't mind um, a number between one and 10 and Mark and Calvin, if you'll uh, let Pam know what number it is, whoever's closest will be 2021. Uh, whoever's farthest will be 2022. I'm actually gonna write it on a piece of paper so you don't think I'm cheating. <laughs> okay, go for it. Mark. Uh, number one. <laughs> okay, uh, seven. Oh, great, the number's four. <laughs> <laughs> I think that puts Alvin closest. Okay, so what we're gonna do then if Calvin- Actually, it's right in the middle. <laughs> it is right in the middle. You wanna try it one more time? Yeah, let's try one more time. Okay, all right, I'll try another number. And don't you guys mess it up this time. Okay. Uh, six. Okay, Calvin, 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 you're muted. <laughs> oh, still muted. <clears throat> it, it doesn't matter because the number was six. Okay. <laughs> there it is, right there. <laughs> All right, so Mark, the, your term will expire on 2021, at which time you can then reapply for the committee two more times so you could actually serve a seven years on the recreation committee <laughs> and your term will expire on 2022 at which time you'll also be eligible for reappointment um, to the committee as well so um, Pam I'll put this information together and send it to Ella so that she'll have it for the official record great okay thank you All right, so the next order of business, Pam, is we'll need um, nominations for elections of officers for the Recreation Committee. All right, nominations are now open for the chair of the Rec Committee. Do I have any nominations? I nominate Jim Betts. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, do I have any additional nominations? Okay, no additional nominations. Nominations are now closed. All in favor of Jim Betts serving as chair of the rec committee for the coming year, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And Jim, you can't vote against yourself. <laughs> okay, Jim, congratulations. Thank you. Having just finished serving as chair on two committees, I don't know whether to congratulate you or give you condolences, but you'll well, figure it out. Okay, okay, so do we have nominations for the vice chair? Nominations are now open. So, nominate Don. Okay, do I have a second for Don? I have a second. Great. So do I have any additional nominations for Don? No additional nominations, then nominations are closed. Can we have a vote on Don for vice chair? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? No opposed, okay. Don, congratulations, vice chair for the coming year. And we don't do secretary, correct? You don't do it here either. We do. You, the, the oh, you do. All oh. committees nominate a secretary except for your old committee. Uh, oh, <laughs> my, okay. <laughs> so do we have nominations for secretary? Would anyone like to step up? There are no nominations. We need someone to step up for secretary. Well, we were kind of hoping that either Mark or Calvin would uh, do it since they're new. And, uh, <laughs> everybody is normally served here. It's not my first year, but uh, 
Serena's done a great job, so she doesn't want to keep doing it for another year or two. So would either one of you uh, care to step up? Mark? I, uh, what are their responsibilities? I guess that would be my question. Well, I'll let Serena tell you what she does. Uh, you take the minutes of the meeting, you type them up, and you submit them to Stacy and to Jim. Okay. That would not be in my wheelhouse. I'm not, I don't type, and I, <laughs> I was spoiled with a, a secretary and area coordinator my entire life, so I'm not very computer illiterate and just learning that stuff. And if anyone else is thinking of it, um, just and just so that you know, on the Governmental Affairs Committee, we actually use um, a free app on your cell phone called Temi, and it, and it actually recorded the entire meeting. It's a dictation app, and so then all you have to do is listen to the recording and type up the minutes. It makes it way easier than trying to do it during the meeting. So if that helps. That's kind of neat. I didn't do that. Uh, with, with, with twisted arm, I'll volunteer. <laughs> Thank you, Calvin. All right. So Calvin is nominated. He was voluntold <laughs> for the secretary position. And uh, do we have a, a second on Calvin's nomination? Second. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Mark. <laughs> so, uh, are there any other nominations for secretary? There being no more nominations, the nominations closed for secretary. Can we have a vote? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Calvin, you are the man. Thank Calvin, you, Calvin, you should have held. You should have held out a little bit. I think she was going to offer a car next. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and the app is free. It's called Temi. T E M I, and you just download it. Piece of cake. Okay, Jim. The meeting is is now yours um, as the chair of the recreation committee. All right. Well, I have a question. Maybe it's for Pam start with. Are we supposed to read this uh, official uh, hoardings thing before we start the, the standing committee? That's what it says in the article that was uh, updated on July, uh, April 15th. And it's uh, chapter one, article 26. You guys do it uh, at official board meetings, you know, as far as the uh, official video on YouTube. Do we have to read that on this meeting? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Stacy, do you know anything about that? You know, it was a bylaws, or it was a change put in during the April meeting that there was a, uh, the board member was supposed to read that the only official recording is the one that's done by the Hot Springs Village POA and then posted on their YouTube channel. The only thing I would say is because we're doing this as a Zoom meeting and no one else is present, it is a virtual meeting. Um, whether or not that's required, Jim, I, I don't know the answer, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll have Pam maybe check that out with the board at the next discussion session to find out if we're supposed to be doing that or not. Well, that's good. I, I mean, I, I don't think it's needed myself, but anyway, I just wanted to ask because it talks about standing meetings, and I asked anyway. Right. So with that, uh, I'll call this uh, meeting to order uh, Monday, uh, June 8th, Recreation Committee. And uh, <clears throat> do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? I'd like to make a, I'd like to add an item to the agenda. Okay, first of all, I'll get a second. Uh, I'd like to add archery range to new business. Archery range. Jim, where do you want to put that on the agenda? Uh, it's been so long, I think we probably put it back on new business. Wouldn't we? Okay, but you want to add it as G then? Yeah. Okay. I have two additional items that have come in since the agenda came out. I have a property owner request 
to have a discussion on a Cortez kayak launch. If we can add that as H. Mm -hmm. And then as I, we need to do a charter evaluation for the Recreation Committee. Charter evaluation. So where are you putting that? New under new, oh, both under new business. One is H and one is I. H and I, okay. Well, Stacy, I have a uh, question. It's not really a change, but uh, under item H, you have uh, staff comments, and that's always been listed as director comments, and that's what you normally you talk to about that. Is that just a I change? changed that because when they change the, the items in the agenda or in the um, policies and bylaws, now instead of being, you know, the director is assigned to the recreation committee, it could be assigned by anyone. Um, whoever the, the interim GM or the GM or the CEO or however they function that. So I just change it to staff comments, um, thinking that, you know, the assignee may not always be the director of that division. Assignee, oh, oh assignee of the report? Yeah, the assignee to the committee will be an okay. employee of the association, but may not always be the director. That uh, changed it from director's comments to staff comments. Okay. Okay, I got you. I just was curious as to why that changed. Yeah. All right. Uh, so with those two changes, uh, I guess uh, anyone want to change the motion? I move. Okay. Second. 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 Everybody's yeah. all approval. Say aye. 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 All right. Uh, to hear a motion for the uh, past minutes. So I have one change on the past minutes, um, and that was under guests. Uh, when we, tuck, when we um, typed it up um, and when it was sent in, um, Tucker Omahandro become Tom, it became Tom. So we just need to change Tom to Tucker. Oh. Guests. Oh, I thought I had a relative on here. No, no. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I don't know if it's a comment or maybe I just misunderstood, but uh, we talked about uh, changing the charter, you know, having a minimum of 11 people, members, and then with the new board member and the director now part of the team, we would put it at 11 and uh, maximum of 13 if we needed them. Now, did we talk about that on May? I thought we did. It didn't get into minutes. That's all I was wondering. April. It was in April. April minutes. Was it April? It was the April minutes. Okay, I didn't remember that. Okay. So uh, I assume, uh, is that going to get changed or does that go through the board or what? It, it'll have to be, all charters have to be approved by the board. And I have that chance to submit to Pam to further to the board. However, that's when I thought the committee probably needed to take a look at the entire charter. So if we're asking them to make a change to the charter, we might as well have them make all the changes at once. Uh, and it used to go from us to the governance committee and then back to us and then up to the board. Um, so that's why I have the 11 to a minimum of 11 and a maximum of 13 as a change that we wanted to make in April. But we did yeah. review then the entire charter in May. And that's why I, that's why I wanted to add it to today's discussion. Yeah, because I think there's a couple of other changes that need to be done on that too, because of the, I think they changed the turnover to be May now instead of April. Whatever. That's right, and the charter still has the wrong language on it. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's coming. All right, any, what do, we, do we get a second on the uh, motion? I'll second it. Uh, any comments, other comments? So I guess with these corrections, is everybody good with it? All right, uh, have a vote to approve. Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carried. All right, uh, chair comments. Um, I really don't really have any comments. I do have a statement the uh, I have asked the uh, Balboa Yacht Club to uh, 
think about having a parade on the 4th of July with a few boats, okay? <clears throat> and uh, of course, what, I mean, if you're in a boat, you, uh, you can do the social distancing pretty easy. So right now I've got a acceptance of about 10 boats and I just sent this out day before yesterday. And uh, so we're getting that. It, it'll be kind of a, it won't be a real light show. I mean, some people decorate their boats, some don't, some will just have a flag. I just thought it'd be good to, since we're not doing the fire uh, works that uh, the people could sit on their dock or whatever and we could go by and honk the horn and you know wave the flags and I thought it might be a you know a good patriotic thing to do so uh, I you know we don't have it all firmed up yet and uh, we'd probably right now my idea would be to start about 7 30 and take an hour and a half or almost two to go around all the coves and everything else so probably done about nine you know, and, uh, but anyway, I just want to let people know, and uh, if we get this uh, organized, you know, I'd like to be able to advertise a little bit just so people can get out on their dock and do that kind of thing. I don't expect a big crowd on the beach or anything because we're only going to be there a few minutes, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll probably start at the marina and end up at the marina. So anyway, it's just, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on it, but. Uh, That's a great idea, I think. Great idea. We did it last year on um, Coronado, and we'll most likely do it again. Yeah, you know, it, it's good patriotic, and I think people want to get out and celebrate a little bit. And a lot of people will be having barbecue as long as the day's nice, anyway. So, and I have heard that the Explorer is going to have music and uh, cookout that day too. So, yeah. Know. So, Jim, that's actually under under new business item B. So I was going to oh, do an update on the 4th of July and what we know about okay. what those um, independent vendors are going to be doing in addition to what we have planned. And so if you, right, if well, I'll let you know waiting. about this, uh, this parade, if we get it, you know, and then maybe you can yeah. get us advertisement on that too. All right. Thank you. All right. That's all that I have. Uh, all right, Pam, any, you got any board comments you'd like to, um, not, not at this time. It's, we're still so early and I'm very new to the board. So if you guys will give me a pass this month, I would be incredibly grateful. And you know, maybe Tucker, um, Tucker, do you have anything to say from the board? No, not really at this point. Uh, okay. I'm, just, I'm just kind of a bystander here. Yeah. I, I think the important thing that, um, uh, to note is that the, the board is getting lots and lots of emails, as you might expect from people that, um, you know, have, have ideas, have suggestions, have, have thoughts about things relating to recreation, among other things. And uh, we're, we're just doing our best to kind of filter things and to keep things moving along. So hopefully I can bring some of those to you. Uh, in the future and uh, we're trying to at least respond to everyone that sends us suggestions or ideas and and thank them for their time and and their thoughts so that's kind of where we are right now okay all right with nothing else uh, we'll move on to, uh, to Stacy's staff comments I guess now I feel bad because Pam was short and sweet and, and mine is, mine aren't. So um, we'll just kind of uh, go as we go through here. So on the agenda for today's meeting, um, at the end of the May meeting, we had had a property owner request um, uh, the committee to look at a Coronado Pavilion. Um, I have not made that um, attempt to reach out to that member yet. One of the things that we're doing at the end of this meeting is putting together the capital subcommittee and of course that's going to hinge on some board decisions in terms of capital and capital expenses for 2021 as well as 2020 um, but i will reach out and i'll have that information prepared for that subcommittee um, that will be studying capital from the creations standpoint um, and then on um, the memorial brick project so that is a funding mechanism for um, sponsorship dollars for the outdoor pool. Because of COVID-19, we were gonna do a kickoff and a combination of, of a commemorative brick as well as um, um, 
you know, an annual fee to the pool. That's because of COVID, that's a little hard to do. You can't get uh, multiple people together. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna kick off a campaign for later this fall that will coincide with the 50th anniversary weekend uh, celebration that we're gonna do that will start the sales of those commemorative bricks to commemorate the first 50 years in Hot Springs Village. And for those of you who were able to take the pool tour with us uh, from the Recreation Committee, uh, remember those commemorative bricks will be used on the sidewalk to connect what the Trails Committee is working on in terms of the DeSoto Recreation Trail over to the DeSoto Club area. So we have the ability um, to do that memorial brick project in a really nice way and we can put it in in sections based on how many bricks we sell for each of the of the sales sections. Um, and then the last thing is the pickleball update. And again, I did put that in my um, written report, um, but I did want to make sure that I kind of pointed that out. So Charlie and myself, the general contractor, are working to develop a plan. Uh, we are um, looking for a professional assessment, a contractor to come in to provide a professional assessment of the surface material. Um, who is familiar with the surface material in, in various places across the country? Um, and look at installation, to look at the material itself, also to look at the site um, and provide us with an, basically an unbiased opinion, not from the provider of the material, not from the installer, um, but on plans that we can use to address um, the surface area of the pickleball court. Um, we did have a bit of an issue, and I did put that in the director's report. Um, we've got too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, and that is, that is frustrating for our contractors um, who had, a, unfortunately, a bad experience with their last visit in Hot Springs Village. Um, lots of people standing around, comments that were made, upset the contractor. Um, we've been in communication with that contractor. We have a really good relationship with the contractor. Um, and so we want to ensure that relationship continues. And so uh, we'll be bringing a plan back together for um, the committee and the board and the staff to evaluate once we have all of that data um, and and we'll move forward from there on the pickleball surface. Um, I also put together a proposal and sent to Jamie this morning that I wanted to kind of discuss with you guys. Um, the fees committee for recreation really looks at fees for those of you who were on that subcommittee. Remember we set an outdoor pool um, subcommittee fee recommendation at $250 for the outdoor pool as an annual fee. We are 45 days past what we were hoping to have opened for that $250 fee, and that $250 fee was based on 50 visits. So in the time that we have left between the expected closing date, um, the difference is about um, 15 days so what I did is took 15 days off of that 50 day recommendation, which put us at 35 visits between now and the end of closing for the pool for the season at $5, which is the price that we had Monday through Thursday for the pool and made a recommendation to the board that we're gonna ask them to adjust uh, prorate the annual fee for the outdoor pool from 250 to $175. <laughs> What is the closing date for the pool? So Pam, the closing date for the pool is on the calendar for September 30th. However, last year, uh, September 30th, it was 95 degrees and stayed that way for the first two weeks of October. So our, our while we have a closing date of September 30th, more than likely we'll probably close somewhere around mid-October, around the 15th. We'll have to winterize by the 22nd of October um, we had to provide our contractor with a date for them to come back in and do um, winterization, which is part of their contract with us for the first two years. So the pool, if the, if the temperatures are cold enough, we'll close at the end of September. If they continue to be warm and people are, are still coming to the pool, we can stay open as, as long as mid-October. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So 175 was our, is the recommendation based on our formula that we used for the recreation uh, committee fee subcommittee. And 30625 was the household. Um, and that's based on um, the second individual fee for a household is always 25% off on our couples rates. 
Um, and so that's how we figured that fee in for the recommendation that we're making for the outdoor pool. Daily fees stay the same. You're still getting the same use of the pool. You're just not gonna have near as many people who are going to be allowed in at one time under strict social distancing that we have in place right now. I'm sorry, what's the reduced, adjusted, pr proposed, adjusted um, home family fee? Group. Yes, the family fee was four thirty-seven fifty, and the recommendation is three oh six twenty-five, based on the reduction of that forty-five days of operations. Are you finished, Stacy? Um, let me see if I had uh, everything else I put in the written report, but I'm I'm happy to take any questions that you guys have. I have a question or maybe a concern uh, with these uh, derogatory comments. You, you made a statement here that talked about experienced members. That's kind of a different uh, adjective, I guess. Uh, so I assume you must know who these members were. Did you no, talk I, to them? I, I didn't get members. That, I mean, all I did was um, talk to the contractor. The contractor was very general in terms. She didn't use names. Um, she relayed her experience to me um, and to our project manager, Charlie Brown. Um, we talked about what our next steps would be in terms of coming up with a permanent solution um, for the cracking and the bubbling that we're having um, and that that conversation would be held between the project manager, the POA, and the contractors themselves. We would develop a plan um, and then that plan would then be presented um, to executive staff at the POA. Um, it would also come through the Recreation Committee and if necessary would also go through the board as well. Okay, well, I guess my concern there is we haven't talked to anybody what their concerns were, but you know, Carla, and I told you that in my email, she made a statement that uh, she felt that it needed to be taken off and I know you're gonna go through all that, but it could cost anywhere from $150,000 to $250,000, you know? And uh, various people heard that. And uh, what uh, bothers me is that uh, when you write a statement like this, <clears throat> you know, it's, it gets, uh, if we go to some kind of litigation, we, the, the POA village, this could be a discovery issue. And it seemed to me, it, the way it was worded, that it's not going to look very good for the POA. That's my concern. Okay. And I, I did send the language over to the executive staff before I included it in the director's report. Um, so they have seen a copy of that statement um, that, you know, we had an issue um, with interaction between individual property owners and um, the contractor themselves. Um, we have all of our contract language. We followed all of the recommendations for this surface material. Um, and that's why I said in here, put a plan together. And once we have that plan ready, we'll, we'll put it out there um, um, at that time. Yeah. Well, as you know, I was intimately involved in all that. So <clears throat> it appears that this was probably something that I said. And uh, she was not... Uh, upset at all we had a good conversation and uh, but she was the one that was uh, complaining about the concrete you know and uh, there were several people that heard her so I, I'm a little confused as to who the uh, ex experienced members were that uh, commented you know I don't know where that happened but I never heard any of that and I well, probably spent 75 to 80 percent of my time down there. You're using experienced as an adjective and I used it as a verb. So there aren't, ex when you keep saying experienced members, what this statement was is that the subcontractor was on site a few uh, weeks ago and I could have used the word had members. It's an, it's a verb for me, not an adjective. So if, and like I said, she didn't share any names. Uh, with me. She told me about the experience that she had. Um, and, and like I said, we, we have, we have people calling her personal cell phone. We have people calling her at the office who are not 
um, members of the POA. They're not on staff at the POA, I should say. Uh, they're not the project manager, um, and they're not part of um, even the board of directors. And so that's when I told her that, okay, here's what I can do in terms of sitting down, having a conversation, putting a plan together that can then be evaluated by the board, can be evaluated by executive staff, um, at which point then we can begin to make some decisions um, or and or then know what kind of monetary um, issues that we're looking at, if we are. Yeah, well, I understand that, and that's good. The The problem I have is that she called me, you know, and uh, <laughs> so that was a Like little... I said, I, she didn't give me any names, Jim. I, I yeah. Well, I, I know that. Went from, but yeah. She, she called me, you know, and then I hadn't talked to her in a year, you know, and I don't know why she called, you know, and, uh, but anyway, yeah, so that uh, kind of bothered me, you know, okay. and it kind of put, kind of put me in the middle, I think, somewhere. And, okay. so, and uh, quite honestly, there weren't a lot of POA people down there when she was working, and uh, so I did a lot of talking to her, and I asked her a lot of questions that may have embarrassed her a little bit because, uh, you know, of the issues there. But they were very uh, professional questions and I uh, hope she didn't take them personally but uh, you know I've been doing this for 42 years and I've dealt with a lot of contractors so I know how to talk to them without making them mad normally and uh, when she left she was in good spirits but uh, you know so I was a little surprised. Okay. Stacey the first sentence there is a really long one when you say and in one case tracking fresh, freshly painted surface area into the middle walkway of the courts somebody said that one of the contract people did that or the contractor said that one of our members did that the contractor said that there were that at one point someone even tracked onto the fresh paint walked okay. into the fresh paint and tracked it out into the, the middle. Okay. And so I just, I added that on there. Too so many people around. Yeah. See, yeah, there are lots of people around. And it's hard for anybody to get any work accomplished when you when you have a group of people standing there um, providing a comment or, or telling them how they should do things. And, and so again, I just wanted to convey the contractor's feelings that were, that were you know, related to me so that everybody could understand kind of where we're gonna go with this next. Well, let me uh, clarify that whole statement there because I am the one that did that, okay? And I admitted it okay. to, I admitted it to uh, Carla and to uh, Charlie Brown when they were there. Okay. Because what, what I was doing was showing them where there were some more bubbles, okay? And I didn't know they had been in there already and uh, when I came out, one of my heels hit part of the paint, and uh, it's so minor you can hardly even see it. But uh, I did do that. that. That was my fault, and I admitted it, and I, I apologized to both of them. Okay, like I said, no names were used in any of this, so that's information I didn't have, Jim. Um, yeah. They were protecting the innocent, um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was given to me as generality, so that we could talk about how we're going to put this plan yeah. together. And how we're going to? Yeah, I knew I knew Carla would think would be uh, blame her, but I said Carla, I did that. It's not your fault, mine. Okay. So, okay. So anyway, all right. I guess there's enough on that. Unless anybody else has got anything. Well, can I can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. go ahead, Tucker. Uh, on the contract, I, I've been confused, and Jim, I've talked to you a little bit too. Uh, we we contracted with one person to do all this work. Am I correct? We contacted with one company. That's correct. To do the concrete to the complete job. They were the general contractor, and then they hired subs. That's correct. Okay. So, who was that contractor? Planet Dirt. Okay. Who are we talking about? About the problem? Who about the problems? So the the problems that we're addressing here were the subcontractor who was the subsurface who was the surface contractor the surface so we're talking to contractor. we're talking to we're talking to our contractor subcontractor we're also we're talking to the contractor and the subcontractor okay I'm, the subcontractor was Gerald Perry out of uh, Springfield 
Yeah. I'm just confused why we'd be having any uh, conversation with a subcontractor at all. That's not who our contract she was with. A, mostly because she has a really good working relationship here. Um, she she's the one who reached out through the contractor initially. And, and Tucker, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know the exact ins and outs because um, we have a project manager who was Charlie Brown, same one that we had for the outdoor pool, um, was the, the project manager for the POA. He dealt with contractors and subcontractors through this whole process. Um, and he is still in contact with the contractor and the subcontractor through this whole process. Well, I agree with that, that during the process, but when it comes to problems, I, I really, then this is an opinion and, and the way I've always done business and that's the way everybody's done business with me because I've been a contractor all my life. Uh, I don't want people talking to my subcontractors. They need to talk to me. Right. Uh, and that's just my personal preference, but okay. just curious. Okay. So Jim, I'll take any other questions that anybody from the committee might have on the written report or the statistics. Um, they kind of talk for themselves in terms of, of um, May's usage. So we did open back up several of our amenities in May. You can see those numbers are still dramatically down. The one that I would say is, is probably not as down um, is you can look at the, and in fact is up, and that is the May comparison for tennis. Uh, May year over year in terms of tennis total visits. We went from 1494 in 2019 to just over 1800 in 2020. Um, but you will see a lot more annuals are playing because the daily visits, those who actually paid a daily fee to play at tennis did go down from 2019 to 2020 for the month of May. All right. Anything else on that uh, item, Stacy? Stacy, the first uh, the first paragraph recognizes Larry Thomas. Yes, ma'am. And, and I know he was the interim position, but then it says he served in the interim position for three months, and he's now returned to his previous position. So, has a hiring decision been made, and who is that? Yeah. So we hired Gil Standridge um, end of March. He came in. I believe his first day was March 31st, so right in the middle of COVID-19. Um, I'm, I'm hoping once we can all get together and have a meeting uh, that I can introduce Gil to you guys. Gil is the Outdoor Recreation Manager. Um, he's got 30 years of experience in recreation, um, everywhere from across Arkansas, most recently out of Iowa, and recently moved back to Arkansas. And so he leads outdoor recreation, which oversees um, the marina, the beaches, the pavilions, um, our base camp programming, um, as well as the RV park, the dog park, lawn bowling, bocce ball, pickleball, um, anything basically that's outdoors. That now belongs to Gil. So I have a question. Do you yes, have any further information on Cortez Beach? Yeah, so it's actually an item on under new business, Tammy. On today. Okay. Yeah. And the other one I have is what is going to be the capacity for the outdoor pool with social distancing? 50. Okay. Five zero. Hmm. Okay. Anything else? We move on to uh, committee comments. Uh, Don, you want to start? Nothing? <laughs> okay. Uh, Serena? Um, I had some co comments about croquet, but we're handling it under old business, so I'm good. Okay. Mary? Um, well, everything right now is fine at the dog park. It needs a good cleanup. Um, more weeds are popping up. And as far as the bocce ball and the lawn bowling, they seem to be getting together over there. So that looks good. All right, good. And we were supposed to go there the other day, but I looked at my rain gauge a few minutes ago and I already had an inch and a half. So yeah. <laughs> I wasn't gonna go. How about you, Tammy? I've got nothing. Okay, Mark, anything you wanna say? No, I archery under new business, so I'll, I'll uh, talk about it then. Okay. 
Calvin, anything? You have to uh, unmute. You're on mute. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, how about you, Pam? You are now part of the committee. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, but I'm so new, I don't have any comments at this point. Just wait. <laughs> you won't okay. be so lucky next time. All right. Any more from you, Stacey? No, but Tom Paprocki has joined the meeting. I don't know oh, if you see him on your screen, Jim, so I don't know if he has any comments or not. I'm just Tom? sorry. I'm sorry I'm late. I started signing on at 10 minutes to 3, and <laughs> I couldn't sign on, on your, in your email like I did last time. I had a setup. Uh, an account and a set up a password and it came mm. me out and given me that uh, those pictures click on the cars click on this click on this and it <laughs> on and on and on I just it just <laughs> really let me let, let me in so <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh, so Tom my account my Zoom account is so old that um, when I click now to take it off a video, instead of pulling up a name, it actually pulls up an old photo of me. <laughs> That's how many years I've had Zoom. Wow. All right, we ready to move on to old business? Okay. Side discussion? Does it? So I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna skip this one since we missed the side discussion, or we missed the side visit. I, I wonder if we plan on that the next month, or is there, is there any? So um, what we can do is, is, here's the thing. If we're gonna do site visits in July and August, we should do them early in the morning. And Tammy, I know how you feel about early in the morning, but um, it gets hot really quick. So if you want yeah. visits in July and August, we probably need to do them 8.30, 9 o'clock, even nine o'clock is hot. Why don't we just do them this week on Thursday or Friday or something? Get it done. Mm -hmm. We can do- it's Supposed to be more. beautiful. Yeah, so if you want to reschedule for Thursday in terms of lawn bowling bocce ball, um, we could do so uh, very easily Thursday morning, or we could try to do it again at one o'clock in the afternoon. Is there a preference for when you'd like to do it? You're talking about this Thursday? This coming Thursday, high is 66 and low is 62. So it's not supposed to be as hot as it's been. I have a doctor's appointment. Okay. I have morning or afternoon, time. though? Uh, morning, well, not in the morning, but I should be back early afternoon. So will you want to do Thursday at 1 o'clock? Why don't we do that? Well, I, I can't make it. I have grandkids okay. coming in, so okay. they'll be. Can't escape that. No. Anybody else? I can make it. I yeah, can I can't it. make it. To doctor's appointment a little rough. Afternoon. Would okay. Friday, Don, if your grandkids are coming in, Friday probably wouldn't be better, but would Friday be Wednesday? Uh, the kids are going to be here a week, and okay. my wife has me committed to all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> Going fishing, I bet. <laughs> what about Wednesday? Um, my Wednesday is completely full, Serena. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Wednesday. I could do Friday, but I, I can't do Wednesday. I could do tomorrow afternoon if we think the weather will be better by tomorrow. It is supposed to be hot, um, but I can certainly do tomorrow afternoon if that would work better. That would work better for me. All right, so would tomorrow at 1 o'clock uh, work for a walk. It may still be raining, maybe. Well, I just looked, and it the mm -mm. Is actually supposed to be out of here by four o'clock in the morning. Right. Oh, moved. Okay. So what is it? Yeah, was supposed to clear up like at noon. Yeah. So one o'clock tomorrow. Yeah, I can do that. One o'clock is fine. Okay. So I'll send out an email, but we'll reschedule the site visit to tomorrow at one o'clock. And we'll still meet at bocce ball. One o'clock at bocce ball. And then we'll be looking at lawn bowling and the dog park. 
I'll ask you to keep in mind, we just had at least one inch of rain in less than five hours. So keep that in mind and wear appropriate footwear. Okay. Okay, discussion? Serena, I guess. Oh, okay. Well, um, Stacy, did you want to start or you just want me to over? No, I'll let you I'll let you start and um I'll chime in if there's anything you need me to do. Um as you know, with the um with our last committee meeting, we had received communication for a proposal for croquet play um, someplace here in the village. And we talked about locating some flat grass area somewhere. Um, and consequently to that, uh, Stacy and I met with Darren Watson, who made the proposal to determine what their request um, is um, and just, you know, kind of like what they have in mind. Um, and um, they were initially looking for some um, croquet equipment, um, which is not necessarily what the Recreation Committee provides. However, um, I'm very interested in establishing a common community green space, a multi-purpose field for different kinds of play where we could play croquet and and maybe have archery and some other types of activities. So um, we did look at the big green field next to the bocce court. So we can look at that and discuss it further when we're there tomorrow. Um, um, it's fairly conducive uh, for croquet at that location. We could probably even set up two, two courts for a smaller abbreviated game um, if, if there were sufficient players for that. Um, so, Stacy asked Darren to, um, you know, advertise it and see about putting together some type of club and, you know, how to go about establishing dues for their club. And, you know, it's, it's a club just like bocce or tennis or anything like that. Um, and I went ahead and advertised it on Nextdoor. So we did have some people, we've had about 12 people um, sign up for immediate interest. Um, when I first put the information out there, it was just, very general, like who wants to learn to play, you know, croquet or maybe interested in participating. Um, but Darren has now, I think, set a permanent or a, a date, which is June 26th, to hold a demonstration. He's going to confirm that and get back with Stacy. Um, and Stacy said, you know, she could get the field mode and we could set it up and do some demonstrations for people to express interest or to show them you know, how to play. Um, I've also contacted Boomers Rock and we are gonna be listing that and having it as a Boomers Rock small group, um, a croquet group. Um, so there is, there is some sufficient interest in it and we'll play initially on the field next to the bocce lanes. Um, I did have the suggestion that we can check into that um, perhaps in the future and maybe if we wanted to have a tournament, um, there should be some fairly decent ground on the golf course driving ranges, not the golf course, but the driving ranges. They're, they're pretty large and they're flat and have grass. And uh, that might be some place uh, we could play or have tournaments on the days that the course, those courses are closed. So we could also look into that possibility. Uh, so some forward progress. Uh, there will be a demonstration. Uh, we have 12 definite signed up. We'll do more advertising. Stacy, um, when Darren gave, gives you the final permanent date, and it is going to be June 26, she said you could put it on the recreation calendar. So I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Serena, what about equipment? Are all these people going to be bringing their own mallets and all yeah. their own equipment okay yeah. yeah so that was a question that darren asked me and i said you know when we talk about lawn bowling we talk about bocce we provide the lane the court the space for it to be played but each player is responsible for purchasing their own equipment or each club is responsible for purchasing their own equipment in order to utilize 
um, that amenity. So when you talk about bocce and you talk about lawn bowling, um, in the case of croquet, the widgets, which, and, and Serena, correct me if I'm wrong, the widgets are the hoops through which the balls and, and how the court is set up. Um, that would be the court set up, the open field set up that we talked about. Um, I do have a note from that meeting about contacting the golf department to see, you know, if a driving range would be available for a tournament, which would be um, a revenue producer in terms of, of hosting um, any sort of tournament or having a tournament in that play. Um, and then we also, in with Serena's field um, of being able for open play and a multi-use field that would be able to support a multitude of different recreation opportunities. Um, one of the discussion points was also to maybe have disc golf um, actually on one of the golf courses, um, maybe Coronado or something like that, where you could play the disc golf and still use the fairways um, and the, the treed areas for disc golf as well. So all of that kind of came out of that one discussion that Serena and I had with the member who had asked the committee to kind of look at and, and do some research on, on croquet itself. Good. So what's the next step? The next step is to determine the date for the demonstration, um, which tentatively now is June 26th. It'll be advertised and people can come play or learn to play. Um, we also told um, Darren, the, the resident who proposed the croquet, um, that it, they, if they wanted to actually form a club, um, they would need to form one and get people to join and, and contribute a little money for fees and they could buy a croquet set and some balls yeah. for the club. Okay. Right now, anything on my thoughts, <laughs> um, anything on the community multipurpose uh, field, if you want to go play croquet, there's some place you can go play croquet if you have a croquet set, or if you want to play volleyball, or if you want to play soccer, or if you want to, you know, go play archery, you have to have your own bow and arrow. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, um, it's not a revenue generator at this time, but it certainly is some place for multiple residents to be able to enjoy the community who don't want to participate in one of the more established amenities and, and for their children to have something to play. Well, I think that's a great idea. Do, do you have a location? Is there one that's available? The field the next to the bocce ball courts. Oh, there's, is that big enough? It's 110, no, 100, we measured it. It's 100 and something one way and 75, 80 feet the other way. Okay. Pretty good size field, Jim, and it'll do a lot of the things. You know, it's certainly not big enough for disc golf, which we've had that request earlier this year from a property owner, but it is big enough for croquet. It's big enough um, for a kick wall if you were to go out and, and kick a soccer ball. It's big enough to throw a Frisbee. Um, so it's some open, wide open field space that already has parking, already has lighting, already has restroom nearby, you know, and it has access. So those are all the things that cost us the most in terms of trying to set up recreation um, availability for people. Um, and it is, it's a larger grass area than the old bocce lanes that we have down over here by the Coronado Community Center. I like it. I just, uh, yeah. I, Grove, I, I, Park, I, Grove Park I, I, is too slanted. You can't play there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I don't think it would be big enough for archery, though. Well, probably not. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it. No, I think you're, no. Yeah. There's a trail that runs behind that property. You have to <laughs> figure out a way for someone who missed the target so that they can hit the person walking on the trail. So that's, that. and there's just so many people between lawn bowling and bocce and the trail and, yeah, yeah. I would, I would be a, and Serena and I discussed it. You know, I, I'd be a little hesitant putting archery in that location. I would agree. There's no way, safety wise, that should happen. But mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get into that when we discuss it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Stacy, I have a question about the parking lot sure. for that whole, you know, usage. Is that going to be redone? Because it's kind of in bad shape. 
Um, I can send in a request to the streets department. They'll normally go in and grade it for us about once a year. We haven't had it done this year. So they go in and, cause it's just a gravel parking lot. We can have them go in and, and grade that area. It has a lot of low areas that, you know, huge puddles yeah, the, form. The grading will take care of that. So they can go in and scrape and grade and do a little roll and, and um, it should improve the parking lot. So I'll send in a request to Ron in the streets department and, and, uh, and have that uh, on their schedule, Mary. Okay. All right, anything else? I'm gonna move on to new business, Cortez Beach. All right, give me just a second because I'm making my note that Mary, I gotta call the oh, streets department. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, so new business, Cortez Beach. Um, you guys saw in the director's report uh, the notification that the POA received on um, May 21st that Cortez Beach had been sold. Um, we were notified that it had been sold, asked for us to um, close the location for guests, which we did. Um, it's amazing what POA staff can do in less than two hours. Uh, the swim buoys were gone, the benches, the picnic tables, uh, the grills, the bathrooms, everything was cleared out. All the signage was removed along DeSoto Boulevard. Uh, leading to the beach. All of that was done um, before, just before four o'clock. Um, and then that evening, at some point that evening, um, the owner of the property uh, notified the POA that the seller wanted to, to keep access open for people to be able to use it while it was closing. Um, at which point we had already cleared the beach, cleared all the signage, um, and it became private property. So uh, with Ricky Middleton, talking about, you know, what's the liability, who lets people in, who, who allows someone to go on private property. Um, the decision was made um, and the discussion was had again last week with John Paul about that decision to um, not go back on private property and put picnic tables and grills in the interim. Uh, it is my understanding, what I have been told is that the property was purchased by an individual who intends to build a a family home on the property. And it is my understanding that that construction is to go forward some part sometime this year. So the decision was made uh, late la or early last week um, that we would continue as we have done, which is not advertising the beach, not inviting people from the POA's perspective to utilize that beach area. You know, certainly of the property in this case CCI and the person who is purchasing the property whose name I have never been told um, you know they wanted people to be able to use it and and that's their ability to do so we just have to look at it from a liability standpoint an insurance standpoint um, because that is private property so is there any plan to put a sign up that says uh, you know use at your own risk or is it there we we had a sign that just said private property no trespassing when we were notified that the property was being closed um, those signs were taken down uh, when the uh, real estate agent for the seller of the property actually opened the facility back up for people to use i don't think there's any signage out there jim just like there's not at your house so if somebody were to walk on your private property to access a trail or or you know or serena's property if they're accessing the lake over on coronado I don't, I have not seen any signage over there. I haven't been back on the property um, since we were notified of its sale because it, you know, at that notification, it became private property. And as a POA staff member, I'm not allowed on that private property. So. Yeah, well, well, it, was, it was always there. private. It was always private property. Yeah, there was a memorandum of understanding in the files. Um, and again, that's where we got into, remember when we found the memorandum and the deed for DeSoto Beach, when we were looking last year um, or two years ago, we found the memorandum of understanding on Cortez Beach as well. I never found an executed copy of the memorandum, but I found a copy that had one set of signatures on it, but never found one with two. Um, and that was the only thing that we ever had for Cortez Beach, always knew it was reserved property, always knew that it was available for sale. Um, but we do own Balboa Beach and we do own DeSoto Beach and that's where we've kind of focused our attention the last few years in terms of dollars. Uh, 
Uh, it just seemed to me that there should be a sign that if people are used to going there and then uh, it's, 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 then it's gates shut, now it's open again, I, it seems like there ought to be a sign, but I guess that's up to the powers to be. To the property owner. <laughs> so, all right. Well, it was my understanding from what I read that the property owner was uh, most willing to have the residents use the beach until he's ready to build. So why, uh, why aren't we making an effort to communicate with him and find a way to make it work? So Pam, the conversation that I had with uh, Jamie and John early last week, um, and it was a, a marketing phone call, so Stephanie and some additional people were on the call as well, um, basically was that it's, it, and again, I, I don't know the inner workings of this property or the sale of this property or when this property owner is planning to develop or build their home, but that it was going to be such a quick turnaround that any sort of memorandum of understanding or anything else was going to be for less than 15 to 20 days um, and they they chose not to proceed in that manner okay all right uh stars and stripes all right is so that, uh, that, terry and i actually the recorded a, a, oh they got one well i, I I've been listening, but I wanted to ask the question, is the discussion over on this? I mean, uh, did we just, is the beach open till June 30th when they close or is it open the rest of the summer? So the recreation department doesn't make a determination of when Cortez Beach is opened or closed. It is private property. Um, and, and so what I would say to that Calvin and what we tell people when they call, um, we typically refer them to the agent for the property, which was Remax. Um, because that, that would be like me telling a property owner that they can come on your property um, and go swimming off your dock because it is private property and now that we've, you know, we've had that communication that the, the owner of the property, CCI as reserved property, is selling that property. Um, anything that we do now, we refer them to the owner of the property, which in this case is CCI. So if you want to know, you know, I'm not telling people that the beach is available for use. That was not well, my question. And my question was really, how do we get to a point where we can let people know? We don't have to make the decision, but we should be responsible for letting people know. So the last communications that I have on that says that the, the Cortez Beach and the information that we put out is that Balboa and DeSoto beaches are open. Um, and Cortez Beach is being sold. That's the only information. Um, Calvin, any future, any further decisions on what sort of press release or information goes out comes out of the marketing and out of Jamie Caperton's office. Calvin, Calvin, I, I believe, from what I know, I believe the beach will probably be open all summer. I don't know that, but I believe it will be, my opinion. Okay, well, that would be good. I've heard that it was open at least until June 30th when it was closing, since it's still really Cooper property until then. So I, it was I understand the gentleman until until he starts construction. He's he wants the neighborhood. He wants to be a good neighbor, and the he wants to, he wants everybody to use that beach until until it's not feasible to do so uh, based on construction and and his and stuff. I I. I have recommended they make sure he gets a general liability policy and uh, and hopefully the board will work with him on that if it's going to be an extensive amount of time if we're going to use it. Uh, I say we, the, the village. Okay, thank you. That's the first of my questions. The second is, uh, since we are basically going to lose a beach, are we going to try to make up for it by either improving the uh, DeSoto Beach or uh, in the long term opening an, a different location for a Cortez Beach? So we looked at a Cortez Beach several years ago. There's not a lot or any really other common property around Cortez. 
that would allow for a beach property. There is property around Lake Coronado, and that is already contained in the capital, the five-year capital plan for recreation uh, to put in a, a beach area on Lake Coronado. Uh, we had improvements for both the Balboa Beach and the DeSoto Beach in the 2020 um, capital plan, but because of COVID-19 and reductions in revenues, um, all of those plans have been put on hold until revenue can be evaluated uh, through the end of May and decisions can be made moving forward with those projects. How about, Ste Stephanie, how about could we move the buoys out a little bit further on DeSoto so it goes deeper? Right now, it's like mid chest on me, so maybe four feet deep. Yes, and I know a lot of people. That's actually done by the lakes manager. There's some sort of determination used about how and where those buoys are, but I'm, I'm happy to contact Brad and have him evaluate those. That's not a decision made by the recreation department, um, but one that's made by the lakes department. But I can contact Brad and ask him about um, evaluating the buoys on the DeSoto Beach. That would be nice if we're going to be down to just two beaches. It would be nice to have it be a little bit deeper and bigger. I can tell you that over this beautiful weekend with the heat, uh, there was cars parked on both sides of the gravel road. Um, it, it, the whole parking lot was full. The, it's just the traffic in my neighborhood was unbelievable. And so I'm glad everybody's enjoying it, but I am a little concerned about, you know, too many people. Was that Cortez or DeSoto Beach, Mary? DeSoto. DeSoto. I live on the same street that goes to the beach, so. Oh, okay. Uh, the, Corn the Cortez Beach was pretty full on Sunday also. I bet. Okay, are we ready to move on? Yep. I think so. <laughs> okay, Susie. Stars and Stripes. All right, so uh, Terry Wiley and I actually did an interview this morning with Tracy Simpson at KVRE for a couple of take fives uh, concerning the Stars and Stripes. Um, so we were invited to discuss uh, what we're continuing with and um, as well as uh, what is being moved and, and how that discussion was made. So Don Langston actually was involved with a conversation with Brad and I and uh, golf in order to try to keep the kids fishing derby, um, to keep some of those things that we typically do around the Stars and Stripes Festival still happening on those weekends. The Game and Fish Commission rules though, um, other than one golf course pond that would require us to park and drive our vehicles on the golf course fairway, um, which I didn't think would go over really well with the golfers in Hot Springs Village. It was the only lake that we found that we could continue to have a fishing derby in July under current requirements of the game and fish. So Don and, and Brad and I uh, decided that the best course of action was to move that when we were moving the other events, which is the September 24th through the 28th. Um, so what we do still have for Stars and Stripes this year on Thursday, July 2nd, we'll be doing a family movie night and I'm gonna let Terry introduce the movie for you. Can you do it like you did on the radio station this morning? Extraterrestrial, actually a circa 82 and not 78. Okay, <laughs> so we're gonna be showing <laughs> ET circa 1982. Um, there you go. And then uh, food and beverage is actually going to be putting together takeaway picnics for families to pick up at their restaurants. So we'll have a, the um, we'll have a family movie and picnic night in Grove Park on July 2nd. And that's on Thursday night. On Friday night, July 3rd, Kiwanis of Greater Hot Springs Village has agreed to continue the mini golf tournament in a socially distant and disinfectant way. Um, <laughs> So we'll have the equipment available. It'll have to be disinfected between every use. People can play within their family groups, but they'll see be kept six feet apart. 
that night, we've added a rock porch with Christine DeMeo over at Grove Park. So we'll have live music. And again, the local restaurants will have picnics that can be taken away um, over to the park. And so you can enjoy live music and a picnic at the park. And then on Saturday, July 4th, we're doing a glow stick kayak float on Lake DeSoto from the DeSoto Marina uh, that night or between uh, meeting about 8.30 and, and sending out around nine. I've been in contact with the um, manager explorer, uh, owner of Explore um, Lakeside over on Lake Balboa. And as part of the original Stars and Stripes Festival, he was planning a food and live music event on July 4th. Um, last speaking with him last week, he was still uh, planning on moving forward with that event on July 4th to have live music. Um, and to have food available over either in either at his restaurant in the parking lot or even at the pavilion. Um, I do not have confirmation of that event yet, Jim. So when you talked about the Balboa Yacht Club and the, and the, the boat parade, it could fit in really well with what he's planning from Explore. Um, told him that last Friday we were putting our flyer together. We'll actually be printing the posters and everything this week and posting those up at our facilities. Um, and so I don't have confirmation yet of what um, Explore plans on doing, but if you can finalize up or you get finalized plans from the Balboa Yacht Club, Yacht Club, we can include it on the printed posters. We can always just add it to our online materials and put it on the calendar um, if we should miss that deadline. When, when are you putting, uh, have the posters ready? When do you need that information? Yeah, so we're gonna print and post those posters up on Friday. So they're gonna be up um, Friday of this week. Um, so we have to have, hope to have them up and ready to go by the 12th. So if you can confirm before the 12th, um, that would be, that'd be great. If not, we can always add it to the calendar or put it on the POA's website. Okay. <clears throat> so what moved in terms of uh, from July 4th to September as part of a 50th anniversary extended weekend um, would be the, um, uh, Let's see, I'm looking on my list here. The Village Big Band that was originally scheduled to play during Stars and Stripes. They're gonna be playing on Friday, September 25th. And the fireworks will be that night over Lake Balboa. And then on Saturday morning, already scheduled was the Village Walk for Cancer Research that will continue. We'll be doing the Kids Fishing Derby over at Cortez on that Saturday. And then the golf department will be having their Shoot for the Stars short game challenge on uh, Saturday. The family day and ice cream social that was originally scheduled by the 50th anniversary committee for July 4th, which has all the blow ups and the rock wall, um, kind of an, an activity for the entire family. That's being moved to Saturday, September the 26th. Um, and then finishing out with a beach party that was originally scheduled on this date by the 50th anniversary committee featuring Colt Neo 45s on the beach um, with a big smoker and one of the local churches is coming out to do food at the, pavil at the pavilion on that Saturday. Then on Sunday, the Anglers Club moved their team fishing tournament from Stars and Stripes. They've moved it to this Sunday, September the 27th. And then because of COVID, our village, Arts in the Village, which is part of the um, uh, Arts in the Park that's put on by the City of Hot Springs, we were planning to be a part of that this year. It was scheduled to take place in April. That was pushed back by the city of Hot Springs until the last week of September, first week of October. Um, and our Arts in the Village will be the, the kind of the, the crescendo of the extended weekend celebration for the 50th anniversary. And we'll be doing the Arts in the Village at Grove Park and Ponce de Leon Center and Tammy, um, who's on the Recreation Committee and represents for our events team. Uh, we'll be putting together some particulars there in terms of, of um, artists who are going to be actually displaying as well as artists who will be selling and artists who will be demonstrating their crafts all at the same time going on between the park and over at Ponce de Leon Center. So there's not going to be any events on Balboa Beach area? There are no the events on Balboa Beach during the 4th. It's just open for families to be able to um, come in and utilize it within their family groups in a socially distanced way. Um, there's a few things that I would tell you and, and some of the things I said on 
KVRE, and I know Pam is is doing a uh, I think an article from the board's perspective, or you know why and and how we kind of came to these decisions. The one thing I can tell you is the beach is regulated as an outdoor swimming pool for the Department of Health, and they even include swim beaches in their directives. That directive requires us to have um, it requires us to have no more than 50 people unless we present a plan to the Department of Health of how we're going to ensure six feet of social distancing. Um, but it also goes on to say in that directive is if you're having a special event at your pool and or beach, you must then follow the directives of the large outdoor venues. The large outdoor venue directive requires every single person over the age of 10 to wear a mask at all times, which means under current directives from the Department of Health, if we were to hold the fireworks tomorrow, everyone on the beach would be required to wear a mask, have six feet of social distance, and the POA would be required to provide enough monitors to ensure that that happened under the mass gatherings, the large outdoor venues, and the, and the swim beach directives that we have in place. The other thing that we could do is we could cut down and only allow a thousand people onto the beach. That's the square footage of the beach, the 36 square feet that required per person. We could allow only a thousand people to come in and see the fireworks, plus whatever you got on the on the boats. Well, then how do you choose which pro property owners get to come and which don't? How do you ensure that you only have a thousand because they can come in by water and they can come in by trails? So these were all things that we discussed between recreation and the lakes and marketing and, and, and golf and, and just to try to figure out how do we do what's right for our community under current social distancing directives that we've been given. Um, and that's kind of how we do that. So what I will tell you is, is Arkansas, Parks, or Arkansas Recreation and Parks Association did an informal survey last week of who and which communities are still putting on fireworks displays. Uh, there were 21 total respondents to the survey. Of those, 10 are going ahead with their uh, fireworks displays because those 10 are not required under any directives of large venues. People can, can be at their homes and they can watch the fireworks and they're not impacted by any other directives by the Department of Health. Two have yet to make a decision, yes or no. Um, four are being decided by a third party. Um, so whether or not it's not a, a parks and recreation decision, it, they're being put on by someone else. And five of them have already decided that they're not putting on fireworks. So some communities are moving forward, some are not. Those that are not moving forward are those who have directives that um, are making it very difficult for them to be able to um, put them on in their communities. It's too bad all the rioters didn't follow those directives. Yeah. We'll see some some big COVID come out later. So, uh, Stacy, a side question before we move on: What's the status of opening for the Desoto Playground at the, at the multi-purpose center? Yeah, so I've been getting that question a lot, and I've been getting yelled at a lot. So, <laughs> now let me let me say this first and foremost: I'd love to be able to open all of my amenities. Um, for anyone to use however they want to use it so my staff can quit getting yelled at and cussed at and and um, um, generally made to feel bad for doing the job that they're required to do by the directives that we currently have in place. Um, that includes the lady that I spoke with last week who, you know, she, I, she just, she wants her kid to go play on the playground. Um, playgrounds are closed all across the country. 87% um, of all playgrounds across the country are still closed because disinfecting, trying to explain social distancing to a six-year-old, um, trying to ensure that they're six feet apart or that they're, you know, that, that masks and what they touch and common touch points. Basketball courts and, and playgrounds are closed. Majority of the places, Benton, Bryant, Little Rock, um, Hot Springs doesn't have anything posted, so I don't know what they're doing with their playgrounds. But in the Benton uh, Parks and Recreation, in the Bryant Parks and Recreation, in the Little Rock Parks and Recreation, North Little Rock Parks and Recreation, all of those places are closed, basketball and playgrounds. We're all working on ways to mitigate that. Um, you know, 
do you do it with a waiver? Do you do it with signage? What happens if there's an outbreak? Um, how do you do contact tracing on a, on a space that you're not actually tracing the people who are coming into that facility? Um, so right now, Serena, they're closed. I reached out to the Department of Health on May the 22nd um, and emailed again on June the 3rd asking for some guidance for parks and recreation associations on playgrounds and basketball courts that don't offer team sports about you know what is their guidance what is their recommendation for those and i haven't heard back yet yeah next door there was a lady that took her grandson down to uh hot springs to play basketball mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, they must not have any rules i don't know they're all closed <laughs> so. yeah is Are we ready to move on now to see Event volunteers for ladies night out. Well, so let me let me hit up the beach access discussion right quick, which is under 11 B number. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so a couple weeks ago, we discussed as part of the recreation committee and we decided on some uh, rules for beach access in terms of tents on July 4th, because it is on a Saturday and that is an issue that we experienced last year. Um, Here's, here's what we decided on. There would be no tents that would be left overnight. Specific areas would be designated as no tents allowed, uh, which included no tents being allowed closer to the water than the front edge of the shade shelter on the concrete slabs. Um, compliance would be um, uh, ensured through the POA staff, the beach patrol staff. Um, and then at that time, we had added a fourth that the tents would be required to be taken down before the fireworks began. Of course, we're not having fireworks on July 4th. So um, the discussion that we kind of had built around this agenda was um, we wanted to include on our 4th of July flyer, you know, that while the beach would be open, there would be certain regulations for tents on July 4th. Is that still needed? Um, or, or do we do away with it this year? Um, and I was looking for some guidance from the committee on their thoughts on that. I would say keep it and do it so that the residents become used to that going into next year. It won't be just sprung on them next year. Should be easier, maybe hopefully a little easier to enforce this year and get them used to it. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Just, I don't see there's any reason not to go forward with those rules. Okay. I well, agree I have too. one caveat to that, and that would be when you're telling people that might not be residents that they can't put their tent up to get, and you're a guy that has a yellow shirt on, um, you might want law enforcement at least around in the morning there to make sure that there's no issues with, you know, people getting angry, being told they can't do something. So Mark, the only thing with that is our law enforcement can only enforce what's law. There is no law that says you can't put a tent up on the beach. Um, but it is a rule of the beach when there's a special event taking place that we can set specific rules or specific policies um, or guidelines within the POA itself. There was a huge issue, which is how all of this was discussed. There was a huge issue on the beach last year um, with tents. And I know, Tammy, I think you experienced that um, in terms of tents and access to the beach and, and being able to get in there um, because there was no there was no order or there was no um, regulations for how and where tents could be caused um, tension between property owner groups. Your tent is on top of mine or don't sit so close to me or, you know, so that's kind of how the recreation committee got involved to begin to kind of discuss this beach access um, and how this, these discussion and these consensus and or decisions were made by the committee to put these three things in place for next for this year yeah i, I was there last year um during you know in, in the morning with all that with my grandkids and it really wasn't you know as you all know it wasn't uh residents I'm, but i'm not saying law enforcement to enforce the tent but maybe to protect a ten dollar an hour employee if you know maybe put a little bit different distinction on there's a police officer in a parking lot. I, I can, it was a different group that was there, you know, that 
I wouldn't want to be the ten dollar an hour employee telling them that they had to take the tent down. That's all right. I'm saying. Just to keep the the population to discourage um, somebody getting out of control. Yeah, Kelvin, I have a question. Yeah, uh, if visitors to the village who are not visitors under the uh, uh, as guests of a, a village person, if they don't follow the rules, can they just be asked to leave the premises? Because they are visitors and we can ask them to leave, can't we? We can. So anytime a property owner brings a guest in, so if there's a sponsored guest, the property owner is actually responsible for the actions of their guests. And the only recourse that we have for a property owner who or their guest who's not following policy is to notify them with a written letter, give them 10 days to come into compliance. If they refuse to come into compliance within those 10 days, then they can be sent to the board of directors for possible suspension of privileges that can only last for 30 days, at which point the board then has to decide to continue the suspension of privileges or to let it go. It's not a lot in our, we don't have a lot of teeth and or authority when we talk about um, enforcement of policy. And I know that the board of directors discussed, had, or did discuss part of this at their last board discussion. And it is something that I think that they're gonna be working towards. Um, our police officers can enforce law, but they can't even address, you know, unless they have probable cause to even ask for ID, they can't even ask for ID on the beach to find out whether you're a property owner or not. If you say I'm a property owner and the police officer has no other probable cause in order to question that, they can't force you uh, to provide ID. Now, and this is all things, Ricky Middleton has met with the committee before last year when we were talking about all of this. He's the chief of police here. We've had a discussion on how we beef up compliance with with policies and and rules and regulations that we have on the beach um, if they're if they're a vrbo and so they've rented inside of hot springs village and they go out to the beach and they're staying here and they have a yellow card in their window um, then they're treated as any other guest or member of the association if they're not following the rules and regulations you know we tell them what the rules and regulations are but in the end, Calvin, if they say, you know, I refuse, we can call the police, but there's only so much they can do if it's a policy violation and not a law, not issue of law. Hey, that was a very thorough answer for those that are direct guests. What about the general public that comes in that is not a guest? After they Be violate the general... rules, can we not consider them a trespasser? No. Yeah, so there shouldn't be general, unless you're a guest, you shouldn't be on the beach. Don, I, I know you've got. Yeah, I mean, I've gone through this a dozen times. <laughs> I mean, if the, when you go to the gate, you're given one of two kinds of cards. Either you're a sponsored guest and you're given a colored card, or you're coming in for some other reason and you're given a colored card that has a little star on it. And what that means is you don't have access to any amenity. You have access to the village, but not an amenity because you're coming in to go to church or the bank or whatever. Now, unfortunately, once you are granted access, I don't, it's going to be difficult to charge them with trespass. The only thing they've come up with is like on lake use, if they don't pay the lake use fee. In other words, they come in with a boat and launch and they'll pay the fee. Then they can be charged with theft of service. But that's so <laughs> far, and some people have been do doing that, and that's the only thing I have seen in recent time where they've actually been able to charge someone unless the police officer has evidence that the person tailgated in or something and got in uh, the property without being allowed in. Okay, well, if use of the lake is a service, then isn't use of the beach a service too? And we don't charge for there's no fee. There's no fee. Well, why don't we make it a fee? 
Well, <laughs> use of the lakes can be charged as service. Why can't the, the beach? That sounds like a good discussion to have at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we haven't had it before. Well, there's a difference in between charging a fee to people that are visiting and charging a fee for members who live here to use the beach. Correct. Agreed. And maybe, well, for it's, the lakes, a, maybe it's only a dollar a head on, on uh, 4th of July, but then you uh, have some basis uh, for those that didn't pay that uh, to uh, charge them. I think the I think the way that it's always been is, is if our, if our guests uh, come in the village, if we have guests that come in the village, they pay uh, what's free to the, the owners, the property owners, members, whatever you want to call it, are, are somewhat free to the guests. Uh, it, you know, just like using the, using the lakes, we pay for that too as property owners. We buy stickers, annual passes, so forth. You can't require guests to do that, but you can require them for a day pass. To use the lakes, but it's it's hard. I think it'd be really hard to do that on the non uh, the 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 amenities that are, are free to the property owners, free to the guests. And like Don was saying, and I'm I'm with Don here. Uh, way you stop this is at the gates, not at the beach. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that's all the stuff that I've heard over the years. It has to, it can only be stopped at the gate. That's the simplest economical way for us to do it. We can't afford to patrol. We can't afford to patrol the village. Yeah. We did discuss potentially putting up barricades at the entrance to the beach, you know, up on, I guess that's yeah. Balearic by the, by the pavilion and having a compliance person there, um, allowing access and people are either POA residents. Um, they have a sticker or a card or a driver's license that shows they live in the village or they have, a pass that says they're being sponsored by a guest and anyone else is not allowed through that barricade. That potentially could also be a place where once we've reached capacity on tents, there could be a large sign there that says, you know, no more tents. It's a, t it's a tough deal. Uh, it's, and I'm speaking from a board member and, and somebody that's analyzed this for two or three years in my head. It's a tough deal. I have my thoughts, and and I'm, I, it may not happen the way I want it to happen, but it, they're going to hear them. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. If somebody sneaks in and follows somebody else in, the plea and has doesn't know anybody here, but gets in and uh, doesn't have a yellow card, and he's using the amenities, the police can escort him out. Is that not true? They. They could, if they could show that they were trespassing. The problem is, is they, they have to have probable cause and a sticker not being on the vehicle is not probable cause to, to, to check their credentials. As I think Stacy may have been saying earlier, mm -hmm. uh, you have to have probable cause and it's, it's, it's almost impossible because I've, I've had vehicles. I've, I'm, I'm a car guy and there's a bunch of car guys. I've had vehicles. I didn't want to put a sticker on my car, especially when they were on the bumper. Uh, so they're not even uh, asked for their, their, uh, POA card or anything. Uh, not police. No, police cannot ask for ID without probable cause. Yeah. But our compliance department can ask for ID or a pass in order to get in the gate for the special July 4th usage. Yes. Yes. Okay. But, but, if but, but again, it goes, again, it goes back to, would you rather do that? Would you rather go find them to ask them the question or ask the question when they come to the gate? But some of them are just getting in the gate and they're not being asked at the gate. They're coming in a back gate or they're tailgating in. So the, the main gate does not solve the problem. People who are sneaking in don't come in the east and west gate. They tailgate. Oh, I, I agree. That's that's a whole other issue there. We got to right. figure out what, somehow. That's what we're discussing about is people who come in the back gate without authority, they tailgate, they don't have a pass, they're not sponsored by a resident, and then they go take up space on the beach, which is one of the reasons we're trying to control the tents and the placement of the tents. But I feel that we could also stop them before they enter the beach and, they would, and we would be able to repel 
the people who do not have a pass. They either didn't, don't have didn't a license they, or didn't, pass. Didn't they do that at one time? I mean, wasn't that? A, a few years ago, we did that in the beach patrol set up just, just at the bottom of the ramp. And right. They said they had to go through one car at a time, and they would check for either the sticker, the POA card, or the card on the dash. And they've been doing that this year as well. Yeah, on the weekends especially. They've been yeah, doing on the weekends that. they set up in the parking lot before you access the beach, and and they ask for your pass or your ID card, um, or or how you accessed. And if you don't have the proper credentials, they turn you around and send you back to the gate. Good day. That's I think good like day. that would also be the time to tell people that there's no more room for tents or to have a sign that says no more tents. So they're told right there before they go park and then get their tent out of the car and drag it to the beach only to be told, oh, you can't put that up. Yeah. So when did, when did we when did we start putting mind. tents up on the beach? Shade tents. Those tents. Oh, shade tents. Okay. Shade so we're tents. talking about shade tents. Yeah, okay. there were there were some blows. Yeah. yeah, there were some issues last year. The other thing that I would tell you, though, is we're talking about Beach Patrol, Beach Patrol, Beach Patrol, Beach Patrol. Beach Patrol's already lost three staff members this year because the people that they encounter, similar to what we are encountering at our, at our establishments, are people who, I don't want to follow the rules, I don't care what the rules are, it doesn't matter that you tell me you have rules, I'm not going to do it. And we have people who are working in 95 you know, 97 degree temperatures who are, who are um, having to confront in a, in a nice manner even to let people know what the rules are and nobody likes to be told what the rules are. Nobody likes to be told what they can and cannot do. So Beach Patrol has already lost three staff members. They're, they're you know, the jobs are posted. We don't get a lot of interest in them. So we're asking Beach Patrol to, to basically patrol 45,000 square feet, which is what we have just in the sand down there. Um, and, and we can't get enough people to apply and we can't get enough people to stay even when they do take the job. And you can't just hire people and send them out the next day. We train them in CPR. We do a two-day training um, in order for them to know what are the policies, what are the rules, what are the regulations. So just keep all of that in mind when we talk about beach patrol is going to enforce this and beach patrol is going to enforce that and beach patrol is going to do this um last i heard they're down to two people and they're open seven days a week so that's that's a that's kind of difficult it, it really sounds as if from what others on the committee have already said and 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 the board is hearing from other people too that that the solution is really at the gates yeah. and, and figuring, figuring out what that looks like rather than trying to uh, patrol the beaches or do whatever that, that people coming in and, and controlling that has to be done at the gates. It's and way easier than trying to get them to turn around and go back out if you catch them somewhere inside the village. But how do you do that? It's not just so. the man gates, it's also the unmanned gates. So as the, the discussion is on how do you control it at the gates, it's the Balboa gates and the Cortez gates and the Glazy Po gates. It's the gates that are unmanned um, that are also, you know, part of that discussion topic. You have to sit a cop car out. You have to sit a cop car out there all the time. I've seen people come see the cop car and turn around. Then but it becomes a manned gate. Get, they can't do that. You know, yeah. Now it's a manned gate, not an unmanned gate. Well, you know, Stacy, you were talking about something, and I, I should know the answer to this, but I don't. But maybe you do. But I think, I think where we may have, I don't want to say went wrong, but where things changed for us is when we became, we we had, we used to have security in the community, and now we have police officers. When they were security, they could walk the beach with a gun. Uh, on their side and enforce our rules, uh, but police can't. Am I correct? So Tucker, I got here in 01 and we were already police officers. So yes, yes. I don't yeah, know when correct. that changed and I, and, and I don't know what happened before that time. I want to say that they, 
for for years they were they were police but they really they were not police they were they were they looked like police but they're really i would call them more security because i've been here since 85. uh they could stop you and and get on to you for speeding but they couldn't give you a ticket and and uh and I believe they could, if we could, I, I don't know that we couldn't have security today at the beach, for example, and then we wouldn't have a problem. I don't know this, but we wouldn't have a problem in my mind with those people. Those people wouldn't be so apt to say, I'm not going to obey your rules with a security officer there well, rather than a guy. The company that provides our security at the gates, can't we hire one or two of them for the July 4th day to be at the beach? You know, I don't know the I don't know the answer to that, but I'll uh, certainly okay. check into it with Charlie. Um, Charlie Brown uh, over beach control in terms of compliance, community development, that um, and you guys know how serious he takes that. Um, and so you're saying we're short staffed. All we're doing is hiring some temps who are already trained in security. Sure. Yeah, I think we could do that. Whether it be the gate staff or a security firm, as far as that goes. Well, the gate staff is a security firm. Well, right. I'm just saying if there, if there was more, it was more up their area. I don't know if the, okay. I don't see the gate staff as much of a security firm myself. I, I'm talking about, you know, yeah, carrying a gun and all that. I have the question, Serena, and I'll email uh, Charlie and, and see if that's something that we could think of, of either gate staff or a security firm be hired for July 4th. It might keep down people drinking on the beach too. Yeah. Because I doubt they that. do. That's, that's, <laughs> I doubt that's, that. not, that's not illegal. Yeah. That's not against the rules. But talking back and telling people the security or whatever we want to call our compliance officers is, is, is uh, I have a problem with that totally. Uh, they need to adhere to the rules here or get out. That's right. Yeah. Yes, as far as the probable cause, isn't whenever they violate our rules, isn't that a probable cause in itself? Not according to Ricky Middleton, but Calvin, I would, uh, you know, he's still doing, I think, coffee with the chiefs. And so I, I've asked that question for years, you know, probable cause, what's included in it. Um, but just violating rules or the regulations here is not probable cause. For a police officer, but not for, for a private Security, right. For a police officer, private security and, and compliance officers, and that's different. Um, but what the law requires of an officer, and like Tuck said, is very different than what's required of a security officer uh, or a patrol or a compliance officer. <laughs> okay. Anything else on that? Now, women's ladies night out. Yeah, so we rescheduled ladies night out. Remembered it was pre-COVID or middle of COVID. Um, it is part of our 50th anniversary celebration from Coronado Community Center. It is a 70s themed event. Um, and what the Coronado Center is doing is part of that is to have a trivia night or trivia as part of that event. And I was looking for, or Coronado Center asked me to see if there were two members of the Recreation Committee. Um, and I guess, gentlemen, you could, you could volunteer as well. But if there were two members of the Recreation Committee that might be willing um, to volunteer to help out with the trivia portion of the Ladies' Night event on August 11th. If available now, if you want to, if you want to um, volunteer now, that'd be great. If you want to look at your calendar and let me know, that would be okay too. Serena, I did write your name down though. I saw your hand go up. So is there anybody else you guys want to look at your calendars? You want to let me know? It is August 11th. I believe it's at 630 in the evening. And where is that at? Coronado Community Center. Oh. Okay. Yeah. They're going to have four rounds of 70s trivia. So they just needed some, some assistance from that. To, to do what specifically? Call out the questions or? You know, Tammy, the email doesn't say. It just asked if I would see if there were any um, um, volunteers from the Recreation Committee that wanted to help out with trivia. Would you like me to have them send you some more information? That would be awesome. 
Okay. I have a question not really related, but while you're writing that down, is mm -hmm. POA informed of any positive COVID cases within Hot Springs Village? I don't get any notification. I don't know if the POA itself gets notification from the counties or not. Um, that would be a question probably more for either John or Jamie to answer. Okay. I hear lots of rumors, but I try not to pass those along. So I, I would check with John or Jamie on that. By, okay. by, law, by law, we can't be told, uh, called the HIPAA laws, I believe it is. They can't tell you anybody, they can't tell you, nobody can tell us that information. They're not, it's illegal. So the best we would get, Tammy, you know, I see the same thing you guys see in the governor's conference. I hear it at the same time that you guys hear it. I, we listen to his, um, we listen to his press conferences every single day so that we know what phase we're in, where we're moving, what we're doing next. Um, you know, and all we get are the county numbers. Here's how many in Garland County, here's how many in Saline County, but we don't know where they live or where they're from. Do you know if anybody, because we have such a vulnerable population within these gates and I, my doctor's office told me that there had been a, a positive case just recent confirmed and possibly more coming. So, uh, you know, that would be something that would, would be good to know because people if are a, acting. If a contact is traced back to one of our facilities, we are required to keep contact trace documents, which we have on all of our amenities um, in the recreation department. Uh, we are required to provide that information to the Department of Health. Um, they would then give us guidance on whether or not we are able to release that information that we've even been contacted. Um, and so, you know, in answer to your question, same thing as Tucker said, you know, there are um, HIPAA laws that, that require us to keep certain information. If we're notified that a positive case is found and that member visited the fitness center on a specific day at a specific time, then we would then be turning over the screening forms for everyone who checked into the fitness center at that day on our, at that time on that day, as well as any employees who were exposed to that member um, when they came into the facility. Does that answer your question? Is, I mean, it's the best I've got for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would, I just would hate for something to happen. Because like I said, we do have such a vulnerable population here. I will tell you when there is a positive test found in your facility, the Arkansas Department of Health requires anyone who was exposed to that member or that person to quarantine for 14 days, even if their test comes back negative at the onset. And that is a directive. That is not a guidance. That is not a choice. If a facility has a positive case, everyone who is exposed to that person on that day at that time is required to quarantine for 14 days. That includes the facility. Okay, did you get any volunteers? I did. I got Serena and Tammy wants more information. So there's my two. If I can talk okay. Tammy into it. <laughs> you know I'm pretty easy to talk into stuff. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move ahead and move on to the outdoor pool update. Sure. So the outdoor pool is going to open on Monday, June the 15th. Uh, uh, 2020. We're really excited about that. We've been hiring employees. They started training on the point of sale today. Our lifeguards finished up their lifeguard classes last week. Um, those were challenging and, I, and I, I want to say a big huge shout out to Deb Johnson. It's very hard to hold lifeguard classes in a socially distanced way. It's kind of hard to do CPR or rescues, you know, someone that you can't touch. And so Deb actually came up with the idea of having the employee bring in a member of their household to do the um, CPR and the rescue swimming with. So we were able to hold a lifeguard class. That's a great idea. Certified new lifeguards. 
by bringing in their family members to ask uh, to um, to act as the drowning person um, so that they could have um, a contact with them within six feet. So, you know, kudos to Deb for thinking outside the box and trying to get the staff that she needs to open these facilities. So the pool will open with some social distance um, guidelines um, under which we're under at that time. So right now we're still in phase one. That's gonna be 50 people to come into the building. They're gonna to have to come in one family group at a time. They're gonna to have to exit the building before the next family group can come in. There'll be somebody on an entrance gate, someone on an exit gate. And, you know, if we reach maximum capacity of 50, no one else can come in until someone leaves. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's gonna be kind of a challenge on the front end. Um, the showers, indoor showers are not open, but there are outdoor showers, at least at the, at the um, outdoor pool. They have to stay socially distanced in the pool, which means we have to have a monitor on the deck. Um, there'll be a contactless payment system. We will not be taking cash. They will have to pay either by credit card or money on card. Um, we do have a plexiglass shield in place um, in front of the employees. We'll have somebody outside that says who can come in next keeping that socially distance, that social distance space. Um, we will have a snack bar open, but it'll be all prepackaged. So we'll have water, soda, crackers, cookies, you know, all things that kids like to eat when they go swimming and they get hungry. So um, the pool looks a little different in terms of furniture placement. We're required to have them a minimum of six feet apart. Um, so there's only space for 30 people to sit on the deck. Um, and then there are, there's two family tables available under the patio and two tables that are socially distanced. Um, so a total of 42 spots to sit your behind, not including the pool. Um, the pool would allow a little bit more than 50 in terms of social distance, um, but then it makes it harder if you don't have a place to set your towel or your bag or your there won't be lockers available when we first open because of disinfectant and, and other requirements by the Department of Health. So it will remain closed. Um, but we're, we're excited to be open. We're, we're glad to be um, unveiling this amenity to the community and, and we can't wait for people to come by and, and see what it looks like. Can you refresh me, what, what are the hours that it's open? Yeah, so we're gonna be open under strict social distancing noon until six, seven days a week okay. for now. And then what we're trying to do and why we're not opening until noon is because we're not able to do some of the classes that we've been doing in the water at the indoor pool, we're looking to move them to the outdoor pool in the mornings. So okay. our, our people who, are, who can't use the fitness center for the indoor pool right now, for walking and aerobics and water arthritis. We're looking to move those over to the outdoor pool in the early morning hours. Um, then we have to have 30 minutes to get all of them out to disinfect wherever they sat their materials um, and have the second group and second class come in and then do the same thing. We have to run back through the disinfection process um, and then open it back up to the 50 in our maximum. Okay. That's a good idea. What, how did the uh, board tour go? I heard some of them got in the water. So I had, um, I had the board chair, the vice chair, and the corporate secretary who came by. Uh, <laughs> the vice, I believe the board chair was the one who, who put her feet in the water. <laughs> she wanted to test out the water. And so um, I, I think it went well. They had a few questions. One of them was about um, golfers and noise from the pool to the golf course, as well as the golf course to uh, the pool. That is the same location that the old pool. And in fact, we're a little farther um, away from the golf cart path than we were with the original pool structures and the diving board and the dive tank. We're actually a little farther away than we were under our old uh, layout. Um, so we just kind of have to see. I mean, there's certain solutions you can also, you know, you could do a um, you could do a natural screen around the the, um, the fences. I have to tell you, you have to work really hard to hit a golf ball into the pool from where those tee boxes are, but two people have still managed to do it since the pool got water in it at the beginning of March because we've found two golf balls in the pool since that time. 
Um, and I'm pretty sure they were aiming for it because you have to really slice hard to get a ball into the water from the tee box. Um, Stacy, Stacy, I'll tell you on uh, Saturday, I was at the pickleball court and there was a golf ball there. Yeah, we, well, we do find them at pickleball and we find them at mini golf quite often. Um, and they're not mini golf balls, they're actual golf balls because they're shooting yeah. the fairway in towards the green. So, but there's certain mitigation factors or, 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 or um, things that we could put in place. You know, we could always put up a net should we need to, or similar to the yeah. screens that we have that would keep golf balls out. But we'll wait and see if that's an issue. Yeah, Folks, I don't want to be rude, but I have, I have a previous engagement. I just didn't want to leave without saying something. So. Tucker, thank you very much for joining us. Bye. Ah. Okay. Simon of fee committee. So we need a we need um, a fee subcommittee made up of um, three to four recreation committee members to discuss um, fee recommendations to the board for twenty twenty one. I volunteer for fees. I'm, I'm going. I'll go on again. Okay. I will too. I'll do capital. Thank you. Okay, so Jim, for fees, I have Don Langston, Tom Paparaki, and Mark Quinton. Was there anybody else? That's for fee. That's Serena. Fee. And Serena. Serena. Okay. okay. And then for the next one was a capital subcommittee, Jim? I'd do that. I said I'd do that. Tammy yeah. and Don. Serena. Again. Is it appropriate that if I, if I uh, go to both of them? You can. The chair can go to as many as they choose. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like to do that. Uh, okay. I feel bad because I'd be happy to volunteer, but I think it'd be a conflict of interest, so I can't do that. <laughs> Actually, Pam, as a committee member, you have the ability to do that without it being a conflict, because when you're, when you're discussing in these subcommittee roles, you have your property owner hat on, and you're a property owner and, and not necessarily representing the board. Um, so I'm happy to send you when the meetings are going to be, and if you can fit them in around all your board duties, that may be more in line of where you may have the challenge. Well, I would think other committee, uh, you know, other um, subcommittees that you have, I can see that, but on the fees and, and the capital, okay. I, think, I think that would be challenging. I mean, okay. I, I don't think that would be the right thing to do, but okay. the intent is there. My heart is in the right place. Okay. So, Jim, I've got five for the fees. That's Don, Tom, Mark, Serena, and yourself. And then for capital, I have Tammy, um, Serena, yourself, and Don. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Okay. All right. Archery. Mark. Archery. Okay. I am. Um... I think at the last meeting I mentioned that I was sending out an email and, and uh, to primarily uh, to anglers, but to, you know, a few other people also to gauge uh, interest in an archery range. I uh, sent out another email to say, hey, let's get together and talk about forming an archery club to push this forward. That meeting happened last week. And thank goodness Mark volunteered to lead that process. So from this point on, it's Mark. All right. So Mark, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Um, I, I was, uh, I have no skin in this game at this point. I was a professional archer for 30 years and uh, um, I'm retired now and due to some, uh, an accident that I had, I don't shoot anymore, but um, the expertise is there. I've been to hundreds of ranges um all over the country actually all over different countries um as a, i shot for, for one of the major manufacturers for years and uh it, it, i really have a lot of expertise in what a range could look like the number one thing i wanted to tell you about this proposal is that it has no direct cost to the poa 
which you know, at, at this point in time, I think is, has the ability to give it some legs. Um, as you know, we have an urban hunt in the village here that has hundreds of, of, of villagers that participate in it. They have nowhere to shoot. So you can't shoot an arrow in the village unless it's during the urban hunt, uh, or unless it's at the fire station, apparently, because they have their own shooting range there on, an, on a target in the back, which is probably not supposed to have. But um, this thing really looks like it, it's going to get some legs. Um, we had, um, out of the 10 guys that were there, everybody was willing to volunteer from everything to, um, you know, throw in 50 bucks a piece to start, you know, with the target, uh, you know, to build a, a frame for it, to put it in. The, the thing that could really halt this is having the right place to put it. Um, a green space, it just wouldn't work because of the liability, the safety issues. It really has to be dedicated. Um, I even looked at the old bocce ball courts, but where they're located, it's just not safe enough. The driveway would intersect the middle of the range, so that wouldn't work. But one of the people that showed up said, have you ever been over where Desposito area is, where the, the POA deposits everything behind, uh, behind Tucker's um, um, sword sheds? I don't know if anybody's been over there, but there's easy – Easy 50 acres, Stacy. I'm thinking over that way, and there's nothing there except where they dump trees or gravel or they pick up gravel. And there's so much space over there, it would be really a good place to set up some bales to do some some archery. It's it'd be safe. There's like I said, no houses around. You couldn't fire an arrow far enough to find a road or a house. So. The, the issue I have there is I don't know how I would gain, you know, access to talk to somebody about using some of that space to put some bales up because it's got enough legs to do it. You know, if you start with one or two, see how interest goes. Uh, we had a good amount of people there. And then I mentioned it to one of the firemen who's my neighbor. Um, and he's like, what, wait a minute, you're going to have an archery range? Well, I got about 20 guys that probably want to do that. And the good thing about that is they're younger. So when it comes to doing the grunt work, I'd be happier to have them do it. Um, so, so I guess that's my question. There's two things I would need from the board. Number one would be to amend the rule that allow archery in the village at the range only when the range was built. And the second thing would be to, to select a site to be able to see if we can utilize that site that I just discussed. So the site I think you have in question, and, and, and Mark, I have your proposal up on the screen so everybody could see it. Um, the site that I think is the, it's about 160 acres that was bargained um, in, a, in a trade between the POA um, for paving rights many years ago. I don't know, um, you know, I don't know who controls the land or who has the, but that's something that I can do in terms of uh, research um, and get with Jason Temple and Stephanie Heffer, you know, uh, and Jamie, and we can get together and begin to look at um, how can we utilize that property? Because um, as Dawn knows, we've looked at that property for many years for lots of different things, including, you know, um, a mountain bike, um, single uh, track. We looked at it in terms of some trails we looked at it in terms of some base camp activities, um, an elevated ropes course. You know, so we've looked at it for, for lots of different um, functions and, and maybe the first function that we could do in that area. Um, and so I have that proposal. So what I'll do is I'll contact, um, a, a, um, contact Public Works and, and make that reach out to planning and development as well as, um, um, John and Jamie and, and say, okay, I've gotten a proposal. Here's the cost in terms of the POA. And basically that's use of the land. Um, and then on here as well with the porta potties and a couple of picnic tables. Um, oh, somebody tell me where, where is that land at? Yeah, so do you know where the Faith Lutheran Church is when you leave Grove, a green Market and you're heading back or Grove Park and you're heading back towards the east? The Faith Lutheran Church is on the right, and you have those storage units where yeah. you go and I go to Fourth. I go. I go to Faith Lutheran Church. <laughs> okay, so where Phoenix and Deposito, it's up there. It's out there. 
Um, the stargazers have used that area in the past to do their stargazing at the top of the plateau, basically. But there's a, a 150, 160 acres out there um, that are that's common property um, that they really haven't earmarked a use for. Is that where they burn branches and all that stuff? Yep. So they do some burning out there. The, the, okay. We call it the quarry. Yeah, so we call it the quarry in, in kind of some right. internal use. And, and All right, I know exactly. What, no, yeah, okay, there's there. quite a bit of land out there. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so, so what, what you would need is about 100 yards uh, for the range and maybe 60 yards behind it. And each bale section would maybe be five foot all across. So if, you know, you started with a couple bales to see how it went, then you got more membership, you'd build some more bales and they're portable. So if you needed to okay. move them because um you know the, the uh, poa failed and somebody else got all the land you know you had a way to move them so okay yeah now, how do you do a back go ahead jim i'm sorry mark how do you do a backstop is that is there something there to if they miss i mean where does that arrow go to is just plenty of land some yeah behind? there's plenty of land you know like i said it there's at, with that area there there would be no safety concerns or liability concerns. There's that much area behind there. All right. So if anybody, anything else happened back there, you'd have to put a, some kind of a stop then, I guess, it, later, or if it ever happened. Well, I don't see where you'd have to put a stop there. I really don't. I mean, you'd build it, you'd put it in a place where it was, uh, you know, there was nothing behind the bale if you missed it. Yeah, okay. I understand. Thank you. I think that's a great idea, actually. Well, I think, it, yeah, next steps here is, is I'll reach out to, um, I'll reach out to the, the appropriate department in the POA and start the okay. discussion. Um, I will include you as a CC on those emails since- That Don would be great. Said you're now the lead. <laughs> and uh, and we'll, go from, we'll go from there, so. Yeah, I think it would really have some like, like I said, Zach Sikor, you probably all know him because of the tragic accident he had, the fireman, but he's my neighbor and he did it in archery. And when I mentioned it to him, he said, boy, well, we got guys be lined up to be able to do that because there's nowhere to shoot. Right. So, okay, so that's kind of our next steps on that. Uh, Stacy, when they uh, do the hunting for the uh, deer, don't they practice somewhere in the village or? Test? And they take their test at the Ponce de Leon Center parking lot. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's not a good place. All right. So, um, Jim, you have a couple of uh, comments over in the chat box. If you can do. look at those. How do I get to the chat box? I don't know where it is. Go to uh, participants oh, up okay. on the right. Got it. Jim Best. Oh, what, then what I, what I... Where you see participants, there's also a box that says chat. I, I can just read it to you. Uh, Pam says, my apologies, but I need to leave the meeting and I wanted to hear about the possibility of a kayak launch ramp on Cortez. But okay. I, think that's, I think that's where we are. Yeah, I don't see or it says chat anywhere. Okay. Yeah. It's it's down at the if you go down to the bottom where there's your mute, your stop video, participants, there's also chat. Yeah, I, I found it. Okay, I see it now. Good deal. All right. Thank you. All right. Just, uh, so we got the last item here then and well, the next to the last. So the kayak um, Cortez kayak launch. So I had a property owner contact me and said um, several kayakers used to use the Cortez Beach um, and the Cortez Lake Launch area is rather slippery. As I recall, there was a subcommittee recommendation of a spot close to the boat launch area, which wouldn't be a major effort or cost to install the kayak. Please include on your next agenda for consideration. Um, and so I guess I'm bringing it forward because that's what I do when I get a property owner who asked me to bring it to the committee um, for a discussion of a Cortez kayak launch um, over by the kayak boat launch. Well, isn't there one already there? There's, there's a, 
a separate launch uh, next to the main dock that is a one laner. So that actually used to be, and Don, you may have to correct me, there is a launch to the right of the launch that used to be the main launch. Right. And they moved that launch over to the left and well, that, 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 the launch that you see now. That was moved because the way the water flows through there, it was always uh, silting in. And it, every time it rained, it, that, that ramp silts in uh, because of the way the water runs in. That's why they, they moved it around. Although that, that ramp could easily be used to launch kayaks from. Except so it's- uh, They don't need much water. I'm going to say it's really slippery yeah, and it's yeah, really I, mucky right. and the geese are all over there. So yeah. I think moving it away from where the geese congregate would be great and having it a rocky bottom, not a mud bottom. And, right. you know, being able to go out in a couple of feet of water helps a lot of people get in and out yeah. of their kayak. Yeah the, uh, the, yeah, the problem with both, the, especially the Cortez ramp, for whatever reason, is it gets, it gets really slick uh, with algae and all. And mm -hmm. that may very well be because they have such problems with geese uh, around the ramp area there. It's nasty. So we did that's include everybody. The... Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, we, that's okay. They, they also have that same problem at the DeSoto ramp, too. It gets very slick also. So in the 2020 budget, we were going to put in a floating um, kayak launch at DeSoto ramp, which would get the, the kayakers and the boats off the same really steep, really narrow ramp. Of course, that's on hold right now. In next year's budget, we had money to do another kayak launch, which we were looking at Cortez. Um, but Cortez was also the area that we identified as the ADA contact ramp or the ADA kayak ramp, which is much more expensive than a typical floating kayak ramp. And, you know, the typical is 7,500 to 10,000. Um, some can be less than that, depending. The ADA ramp, remember, was about $25,000. It's hard enough for just a person without disabilities getting in and out of a kayak. I can't imagine being ADA. Yeah. Um, and, and the ramp that we're looking at for, for DeSoto would also work really well over at Cortez. Um, I just, I almost think, and I know the property owner would like for us to consider it for this year. Number one, with all of our non-essential uh, spending put on hold, as well as our capital on hold right now, maybe the capital subcommittee would want to, you know, begin to create um, a, a listing of where each of these kayak launches would be put in and which lakes they would be on and then associate a very specific amount of money um, to those as part of their five-year proposal. I'm going to say Cortez is just my observation because I fish there three days a week is very shallow. That, that'd be a tough place to put any kind of a ramp. I mean it's shallow out uh, the five six hundred yards from the boat launch. It's probably a two three feet deep. There's no other place. Oh, what? I have to leave. Go ahead, Pam. I'm sorry, I have to leave. But all I right. want to see you all again. Thank you Later. very much. Thank you, Pam. See you later. The one thing that I would say, Mark, is actually if we're putting in a floating dock for the kayak launch so that you put your kayak on and then you don't have to walk out into the the water as far, Tammy, because it has a bench. So you sit on the bench and then you slide from the bench into your kayak. And then you launch your kayak two and three feet of water is not a problem. Okay. It's when you're it's when you're not using a floating kayak launch and you're just trying to launch that you need more water than that. You need three and a half to four feet of water. But if you mm -hmm. use a floating launch, you have the ability to get by with with um, um, a depth that's not as deep. I mean, I would launch at the Cortez Beach and probably less than two feet of water. Enough that I could sit in it, it wouldn't drag on the bottom and I could go. So there's a very slim piece of common property between where the last neighbor is and the beach begins before you get out onto that driveway. But we're talking a very small piece of property and it would really infringe on I mean, when it was a place to park. I'm saying yeah. 
Where would you park? Yeah, you wouldn't. You you know, similar to what we ran into Don on Lake Balboa, you could have, right. but you'd have no parking. So at Cortez, the only other place that you can launch is up in the cove on the other side of the pavilion. You know, that's the only other place that you could look at putting more of a natural um, sort of launch area. And I don't know what that air, what that cove looks like in terms of bottom silt um, or, or anything else that goes on right there. Snakes. Snakes. Serena, you had a, a question or a comment? You're muted. you're muted, Serena. Serena, you're muted. There you go. Noise when I was pouring my beverage. Um, would it not, or I, certainly I feel it's appropriate just to move this, forward this over to the capital committee. Uh, we already budgeted DeSoto for 2020 and Cortez for 2021. Maybe we can look at that, uh, reset the priorities or just determine priorities at that point. Where, you know, where could we put it? How much would we have to spend? And um, that's where it's gonna have to come from is, is the capital committee. So all of the discussion we had is, is very valid, um, but we'll have to look at what we can possibly do and then what it will cost and what funding we have available. Well, was it Don and you and I on the, on the kayak subcommittee? Yes, no, I wasn't on the kayak subcommittee. Okay, I know Don and I were. Is anybody else was on it that that's still on the committee? Kellen? Yeah, I'm an avid kayaker and I happen to live right across from the Cortez boat ranch, uh, boat ramp. So um, I would like to see this floating launch just for my own information. And uh, maybe I could volunteer on this kayak committee too. Good. Yeah, so I can bring examples of the floating kayak launch that we were looking at for DeSoto that might also work for Cortez. Um, and Tammy, what I would say is on the, the kayak subcommittee that we did have, we did talk about the different locations, but we never set a priority listing of who's going first, who's going second, who's going third, who's going fourth. Um, you know, and, and which lake we want to tackle and where specifically would we, are we, is it a floating, is it part of the floating dock system that we already have at the boat ramp? Are we just going to um, improve the boat ramp so that you do have that rocky bottom and, and not necessarily? One of the other things that we did talk about at that subcommittee is that we were going to try to follow the drawdown schedule of the lakes department so that when they were drawing down a lake and we needed to make an improvement, if we were doing a natural kayak ramp, then we could do that when the lake was drawn down. The only problem is when you only draw down a lake two feet, that doesn't give us, in, in terms of recreation, enough, um, enough land to work with to get a proper kayak launch in. You really need a four to six foot drawdown, um, in most cases, to get a, a natural kayak launch in. And I think the capital subcommittee, I think Serena said it, it needs to really prioritize some of that stuff now. Okay. Because obviously there's going to be a big pull on money, which we don't have in the village. So you know, this may not happen at all. You know, so we need to really look at that when we go through this. Do you want to assign this then to the capital subcommittee for discussion? I think it's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is the capital subcommittee's view too large? Should the kayak subcommittee meet, prioritize, pick which goes where since we've spent all the time on it? Oh. Is, is there a kayak sub subcommittee already? Yes. There was. Okay. There was. And it was made up of members of the recreation and the lakes committee um, oh, okay. looking at kayaks. And then there was some pushback 
from the community, not in my backyard that, you know, yeah, that we talk I remember about that. a lot. Um, and administration's um, direction to staff was to let it die until the community actually came forward and said, we want a kayak launch here. And when we had the here given to us by the community, um, yeah. we could evaluate how that would fit into finances. So Tammy, what I would say is, um, you know, unless that direction is changing from the, the administration, and I can certainly send that in as a question, then I would say that the capital subcommittee is probably the appropriate place because we know we've, we've had requests for a kayak launch on DeSoto Marina, at DeSoto for the marina's use, and now we have a request on Cortez. So those are the only two requests that we have for kayak launch sites right now. Um, yeah. We're following that direction of making sure that this is led by property owner requests. Well, I was just thinking if uh, the Lake Committee was part of that, do we have to coordinate with them or not? Well, that commit the subcommittee kind of disbanded after that, so we don't have a formal subcommittee still in place. Okay. Um, so we can we can go from there. All right, Calvin. I don't know if you're on that capitals committee, but he's an avid a kayaker, so he should be on it anyway. I think if he's not already on the capital one. Yeah, Calvin. So Calvin, would you would you be interested in being added to that capital subcommittee? uh not particularly but uh the uh kayaking committee if that is formed again <laughs> that's that not the option. question does it will he be on the kayak committee um, if you're forming a kayak subcommittee my question to you would be um what what question what question are you trying to answer what problem are you trying to solve you know, those are always my first two questions when we do a subcommittee. So if, if you're, if, if Jim, you know, as the chair appoints a subcommittee, um, Terry's having to go. So he's got a daughter at daycare. So everybody can tell Terry uh, the question uh, Terry. you have to ask me uh, and I'll Terry. walk a little through it. Um, but um, what question, yeah, what question are you trying to answer? What problem are you trying to solve? If the problem you're trying to solve is to put a kayak launch on Cortez, that's, I mean, that's already your question. Now it just becomes a matter of where it gets scheduled in capital. If you want to revisit the kayaks again, I think that you would probably, on all lakes, I think, Jim, that we probably would want to involve the lakes committee. Well, I think the kayaking committee would have uh, much more to do than just that one issue. Uh, I would envision a uh, potential for developing a training program for kayaking to greater utilize the kayaks at uh, at waypoint and i can imagine events like a treasure hunt on on the water and all kinds of things that the kayaking committee could do so actually desoto marina is has a training program for kayakers that they were planning to implement this year but with covid that kind of changes things um, treasure hunts are certainly something that we could do, and that's typically done by the events team in terms of recreation. Um, there are members of the committee, and there will be a member from the committee once Jim and I have an opportunity to meet that will be a liaison to the events team. Um, and so you can certainly do that via subcommittee, or you can do that um, um, through other routes. That's completely up to you guys as a committee. Could we look for um, alternatives going that our capital budget is really stressed right now? And so maybe we could find cheaper alternatives to formal kayak launches, whether it's, you know, laying rock and gravel down in an area or, you know, making sure there's access down, um, things that we could do, do that in house. part of the research from your subcommittee. Sure. Yeah, but I don't think we want to start another new kayak committee you know at this point i think we need to leave what we're doing in the sub i guess in my mind i don't think we're going to have the money anyway but. 
I think the June board meeting will give us a better understanding of what kind of funds we're talking about in terms of capital. Um, yeah. So the capital subcommittee could could be their work could be very short lived. Um, or it could be, you know, even harder in trying to determine priority setting from 2020. If we don't move forward with things in 2020, they become, some of them become deferred maintenance in 2021. Yeah. So then, you know, where do those fall in terms of, of new amenities or replacement of, of parts as opposed to deferred maintenance? So you, you kind of get a combination of all three of those. Um, and I think the board meeting next Wednesday would probably give us some better understanding of where the board is headed in that because they'll have the financials from May. Yeah, when do they do the audit on the uh, loan that we got to prove that the, or decide whether we have to pay it back or not? Did you know what that Jim, is? I, I don't know. I don't know. I thought it was like a two month uh, process, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, so, it, you know, if they, Right now, uh, last I heard, Liz, that think they're in good, pretty good shape, would not have to pay it back, but they have to go through this audit and they have to send a whole bunch of stuff in or whatever. But, uh, you know, it happens that we've got to pay it back and it's going to make it worse. I, don't, I just wondered when they that out. And Jim, the other thing I would say is since Calvin and Tammy have both expressed an interest in, in kayaking and coming up with alternatives and training programs and events, we don't have to have a formal subcommittee assigned. Um, if if members of the committee wanted to get together and do the you know do some research and come up with some of that information and bring it back to the committee, um, that's another way to do it. You don't have to have a formal subcommittee that meets at a formal time. If there are several of you, kind of like what Dawn and and Mark did with the um, with the um, proposal that we got. You know, we can do the same thing and be brought before the committee and then discuss it as it's already been written. So it's not something that has to be a, a formal subcommittee. So there's an alternative so that we can, we, we don't lose sight of kayaks. Um, because I will tell you the trails committee and the lakes um, department and the lakes committee are getting ready to start new tra uh, kayak trails on our lakes. So oh, really? Committee has been working with Brad came to um, a recent trails committee meeting we're going to be putting in a kayak trail on Lake DeSoto uh, with the buoys and marking and putting out a trail map and all of that kind of stuff um, probably by this fall is our goal yeah well that, that's a good I guess uh, Tammy and Calvin if you want to do that fine with me I mean I... my next step would be to Get in touch with the guy who's who's doing the training at uh, DeSoto uh, uh, Waypoint. Who yeah, I can send that to you. I can send that okay. to you. Yeah, and uh, is he the one that's going to do the trails too? Yeah, no, the trails, the the trails, the the kayak trail is being done by the Lakes Department, Brad Meredith. Um, and I, once he has the buoy set, I was just thinking of Calvin. Uh, you know, you're such an advocate in uh, kayaking. I want to talk to the lake committee or whoever that is. Yeah, so I, Calvin, I'll send you the information on uh, who's doing the training at, at the marina, and then I'll also send you the information um, on Brad's recommendation for the trail on photo. In case you don't know, Calvin does a lot of river kayaking, you know, and he would like to train people rivers, you know, okay. as well. You know. Okay. And he talked to me about that something that he's very much interested in. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. I, I need to go. <laughs> okay. I got I have to take the dog out. <laughs> <laughs> well I think we're about done. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just one more item. One more, okay. Evaluation. So the only thing that I want to tell you is is the charter evaluation. Um, just as Jim said, there were some things that probably needed to be changed in the charter. I sent you guys a copy of it. If you'll review that, and, and Jim, the only problem, I hate to wait till the next July meeting to actually send those changes. So if that's something that maybe we could do before the end of June, so that the board would be able to evaluate them at their um, July 15th meeting. What? You want to wait till August? 
you want people to uh, comment on them? Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, say so to send in, and I don't mind. Um, I don't mind organizing that if they want to send me comments on the charter that I sent you. Um, okay. I compile them into a document, send it back out for um, the committee members to be able to then comment on as a whole, uh, whether you agree or disagree, just as kind of we're going to be doing with minutes. Um, and then once we've reached that um, decision that this is good, um, then we can submit it to the board um, for the evaluation at their July 15th meeting. Okay, so can everybody do that? Say in a week or so? Yes. Okay, has everybody got a copy? Yeah. And, yeah, but I don't know what the changes are. Well, just read it, see what you Yeah, know. read it and, and it, what it is, it's your suggestions on what changes should be made to the charter. And then if you have any changes that you think should be made to the Recreation Committee Charter, you'll send them to me. Right. And I'll, I'll color code everybody's changes onto one document, send it out for the committee to then evaluate. As yes. I understood all that. The question is, aren't there some already known changes that were desired to bring this to the forefront in the first place? Only one. And that was that there was, instead of having um, under 3A, the committee shall consist of 11 members. Uh, the only change that was recommended at the April meeting was to change that to say a minimum of 11 and a maximum of 13. That's the only change that has been recommended right now on the charter. The board made a lot of changes that will affect our charter as well. But I think if we make them as part of these recommendations, then they can they can make those changes at the same time. Does that make yeah, sense? I think there was one thing else, you know, is uh, the approval of members was in April or a May start or something. Or what the, or, uh, yeah, committee they, members shall be appointed prior to the regular April board meeting, and now that's been changed. So that's some of the changes. And then we need to look at duties and responsibilities. Really, that's where the committee. Um, makes decisions on on what we're doing and and how we're doing those things. So, um, organization and appointment duties and responsibilities. Now, limitations um, and meetings and reports. Those are all the same for all committees. That'll be set at the board level. But you may see something there that you think should be suggested at the board level, and so we can make that suggestion. Okay, I guess you gotta read it. Uh, but yeah, if we can have those, if we can have those changes, um, maybe by the 26th um, of, of June, yeah. then I can send the document out by the 29th. Um, and then by July 3rd, we would be able to send it in for board's consideration at their seventh work session and maybe a vote then by July 15th. Okay, what day did you say to have the comments in by? Friday, June 26th. Okay. okay. We looking for a motion? Motion to motion to adjourn. Adjourn. Wait, the honey the trail. Have a second. I second it. Everybody say aye. 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 All right. Thank you.